back, everybody. We're answering your questions and we're going to jump right to it. Shannon, what do you have for me? I have a question from James. Uh, and he says, I'm not a parent, but rather a college and career counselor. Uh, yay, another counselor um, listening, which we love. Uh, counselor at a traditional public high school in Colorado. I'm an avid listener of your program and greatly appreciate your perspectives. Just about one year ago, College Board announced that they were discontinuing the optional SAT essay portion, except in states where it is required as part of uh, SAT school day administrations. I was surprised to learn that Colorado is one of the states um, where it's actually legislated that schools must offer the writing portion at no cost to any student who wishes to opt in. Given that we are now in the registration timeline for our current junior class, I'm wondering what your position is on the value of this optional test portion within the scope of admissions decisions, especially since the great majority of students nationally will not even have an option to do it. Bottom line, does the SAT optional essay now stand to hold any weight with admissions officers? Hi, James. I think it's worthless. I think that I would not be encouraging students to take it. The very fact that not everyone, in fact, nobody, unless almost they're nobody. taking it during, right, so good way, almost nobody <laughs> could take this even if they wanted to, means that they're just not going to be considering it. I have not seen or heard from one college that says, well, now that it's no longer available, if you still fight, figure out a way to get it to us, we'll look at it. Maybe Georgetown, sorry, shot across the bio there. But um, I would say that I do not think it is valuable. I think it's something I would not have students stressing about or wasting their time on. When my own son took the SAT, um, it was still a possibility. I believe the first time he took it and I didn't have him sit for it because I personally saw no value to it in the admissions process. So I would say freely advise your students that they don't need that piece. I'm going to go out there and say nobody needs it. <laughs> going on record. Fair or unfair. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, I have not seen it be impactful. Perfect. Next question comes in from Virgil through our Facebook page. And Virgil first says, I love the show. My Yay. wife and I have four kids. My eldest is in eighth grade and we are deciding on high school for the next school year. We've narrowed down our options to two choices, both private. One is very small and does not offer honors or AP classes. However, the school culture is strong and academics are solid. They say that their courses compare to many AP courses, but are better because they don't have to teach to the test. They argue that their classes offer far better depth of learning. Graduates of this high school attend a wide range of schools from selective to community colleges. Because the school is small and relatively new, they don't have an established reputation with colleges outside of Oregon. The other school offers many honors and AP courses, and because of its size, it also offers tons of extracurriculars. The school culture is strong, and the girls who attend this school are serious learners and 100% go on to four-year colleges. This school has a very strong reputation with colleges all over the nation. We see pros for both options. Which high school would best prepare our daughter for college and college admissions? Got it really good questions here and i would start with a bigger question which is what is the end goal and i don't really mean where do they want to go to college but what i really do mean is what is the you know at the end of the four years in high school i think the end goal especially because based on your question is that a they are going to go on to college but that they're prepared for whatever the next phase is and i do think and certainly we're guilty of this because this is what we spend our time focused on. We focus on college and on getting students ready to apply to college. But high school is its own thing. And high school is a time where your daughters are going to uh, grow both academically and socially. And so what I would focus in on the most is the place that has the environment that you feel is best suited to your daughter. So um, you have four, I don't know that they're all daughters, um, but you have four kids and I only have one child, I do have a stepson, but one thing I hear from my, my friends who have more than one kid, Shannon, um, is that their <laughs> kids are, are usually pretty different. 
So the other thing that it could happen, right, is that one one place that is right for one one of your kids might not be right for the other. And um, I'm thinking even of in my own personal life where I was um, a scholarship student at a small private day school for high school that I loved. That was a great fit for me. And my brother was went to a not as small Catholic school that was closer to home and um, because they it was really a better place for him they had a much more robust sports program and he was really a talented athlete I was not um, so there were the the two places were different but they were well suited to each of us and I would say the same thing here if the goal for if you have a goal for your children that you want them to get out of Oregon for college, well, then that is one factor that might be in favor of the second school. But I certainly wouldn't rule out that the first school is a place from which they could get out of Oregon for college as well. You know, by the time they graduate, it's only eighth grade, that school may well have established itself outside of the state. So they're in the earlier phases now that could grow. The other things I would look at are the level of competition. You know, at a school where 100% are going on to four year colleges and there are a lot of APs and honors, how much pressure is there within the school to take all of those courses, even if it might not be the best path for that particular student? Does the first school, um, is the way that that's structured, does that impact how people feel about, oh, well, I have to have this more advanced course, or does it allow for um, making choices that are really better suited to, this, to the student? And my questions might make it sound like I'm favoring one over the other, but I'm really not. I really, they both sound wonderful. Yeah. I just think the question is, which one is the most wonderful for your individual child? And so that's how I would really look at it, um, stepping beyond the, you know, which one has the better reputation or which one sends students to the most prestigious schools. And I, I don't think you're super focused on that because you've narrowed it down to two schools that sound like they have slightly different outcomes. Um, so I would really focus on that. and. Not to also leave out the extracurricular piece, right? So if you have a child who's really involved in a particular area or activity um, and one school has a lot in that area and the other school has nothing, um, well, maybe it's possible that the other school could start something at your child's request or that they could get something new going, maybe a new sports team or a new club right. organization, right? But if they are if the op options are limited, they might always be limited. And is that going to be a negative for the first school versus the second? So um, here's where I know it would be nice if I could say, this is the choice, this is the one. Yeah. But I really do think at the end of the day, it very much comes down to your individual student and what is right for, for that particular student and you know you right. might be going through it all over again shortly right so, <laughs> okay. so the, the bottom line question is i think where will your student thrive yes. and that that thriving may encompass the college admissions process but it's much bigger that's exactly that. right yeah. that's exactly right good way to succinctly sum up what i yeah, that's what i'm here for <laughs> all right all right, Shannon, we're going to do our best. We got a couple more here and I'd like to get through them. Yeah. This next one comes from Bruce via email. Bruce asks uh, or says, we're in California. My daughter applied to a number of UCs and Cal States, which we can afford, and also applied EA to University of Oregon, Fordham and Madison, Wisconsin, where we would need some scholarships. Due to our income, we will not be eligible for any need-based aid. However, I heard on your podcast that some schools require the FAFSA to be considered for merit aid, so I submitted our FAFSA at the end of October. She was admitted to University of Oregon Clark Honors College with a $10,000 per year merit aid. She was admitted to Fordham, but no word on merit yet. I reviewed Fordham's website, and it seems like they might want the CSS profile too, so I emailed them for clarification. They responded today. The free application for student, federal student aid and CSS profile are required to receive maximum consideration for all types of aid, including Fordham grants and scholarships. 
I find it hard to believe they want so much detailed financial information, i.e. the profile, from us when we are not requesting any need-based aid. Have you seen the CSS profile required for merit aid only consider for merit aid only consideration before? Should I be surprised or is this normal? Yeah, so it I would say it is not uncommon. <laughs> Uh, is probably how how I would put it. Um, so I will say the we happen to have insider access to Fordham. We have actually a number of people uh, on our staff who previously worked at Fordham. So I went to this them with this question to confirm my suspicion, which which they did confirm. Um, so specific to Fordham, I can say, and I think this will uh, there'll be lessons for many schools here. Um, while they require the profile to um, distribute any merit scholarship money to you, um, the details of your finance, finances will not affect how much merit scholarship you are offered. Um, you will never, from Fordham at least, and I think this could apply to a lot of schools, get less merit scholarship money based on anything that is on the profile. What it could change is where the money comes from, or if you ha end up having some need-based aid eligibility, you could actually see more. So essentially kind of no downside in, in completing that profile. So what is going on here, and we have talked about how the FAFSA is sometimes required. Um, I probably could have done a better job in articulating at schools that require the profile. Sometimes, not always, the profile is also required. Um, so, and we've talked about how schools might require financial aid applications to be considered for merit, sometimes just to confirm your US citizenship, that is done through the FAFSA. Sometimes it's sort of a, um, a measure of how price sensitive you are. If you file an aid application, they think the money matters to you. So that, that leads them to consider you for merit scholarships. Sometimes, it is only really for accounting purposes and having a fi full sometimes financial aid application on file helps a college spend their funds in the most efficient manner. So schools have many funds at their disposal in terms of what they can award in terms of discounts. There's government financial aid, there's merit scholarships from the school, there's need-based grants from the school, there is often endowed scholarship funds that folks have donated to the school. And getting the most detail about you as possible helps them to spend those funds efficiently. So you have said in this question that you don't expect to qualify for need-based aid. The only way they know that is if you file a, a full financial aid application in, in Fordham's case. Um, why they care is it affects their accounting. If you end up qualifying for need-based aid, maybe they have more of that money. So they would spend it out of their need-based funds. They could use some of that merit scholarship money that you would otherwise get and give it to somebody else who doesn't have need-based aid eligibility. Certainly, if you had government financial aid eligibility, they would much rather give you that money. So freeing up more money for them to spend on other folks and, and other things. Um, so they wanna find out if you have government financial aid eligibility. They wanna find out if you have uh, eligibility for any very specific endowed scholarship fund that they have that has very specific, specific requirements, they can get that off of the profile. So that's why they require it. it. It's not super common, but not uncommon. So do it, no downside. All right, Shannon, thank you so much. And thanks for joining today. Next week, Ian is hosting. We're talking about financial aid awareness. Um, if you have to major in business to be successful in business, no. Talking to your school counselor about working with a private counselor. Should you have that conversation? And if so, when? And uh, don't forget, we are here every Thursday, 4 p.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. Pacific.